gentlemen it's a pleasure to be here on doplexus and uh, with my colleagues and friends from sims to the milancha kayur pari ajay naik and everyone associated with this meeting um, so i am dr uday jadhav i am a consultant in cardiology at the mgm new bombay hospital in mumbai i am also honorary professor and faculty with the mgm university of health sciences and uh, uh, my research work has been based primarily on evaluation of atherosclerosis lipids hypertension and uh, in the last uh, few years on cardiac ct and ct radiation where we have some publications so with this um, we are going to have two lectures brief lectures today one which i'll address on the subject of lipoprotein a that is it a prime time investigation now to figure out whether uh, that's something which you need to do in clinical practice and be absolutely sure that uh, lipo is the way forward um, in in terms of assessment of risk as a target whether it adds anything to the ldlc and we can take those questions based on that the second is difficult to control hypertension if you may want to call it as a resistant hypertension a truly resistant hypertension not a hypertension where uh, you have inadequate therapy so you have a complete therapy and then you are not able to still control the blood pressure we'll talk mainly based on the medical therapy of those patients of course there are devices and a lot of new things have happened but i'm sure i, I can share uh, my thoughts on them because uh, i've been working with the american society of hypertension both in terms of the programs we did in india and a lot of our original papers in the prior ash meetings in new york so with this uh, let us start the presentation thank you this is a extremely good area to talk about on the resistant hypertension we see so many patients there are some basic this is a very small presentation 10 minutes presentation i am okay with it please i don't have many complaints you know i am very happy to be here okay so uh i am going to ask you these questions that uh, what are your opinions that resistant hypertension is has a high prevalence in kidney disease is difficult to manage <clears throat> second that i do urinary vma a serum potassium and a renal artery doppler in this patient i select a beta blocker or moxidine as a fourth add on drug i do everything of the above i do nothing of this sort and i don't believe all these things are there so please vote now these are difficult to control truly hypertensive patients whose bp stay above 140 by 90 when they are on all those drugs which are relevant and which are important there is only one quiz so answer okay so everyone does by and large everything 12.5% still feel all these are useless lectures okay so you know my first three slides are just simple clinical based slides but i think they are important they, we should know about this right we are clinicians when you do the simple renal artery doppler ultrasound why i am putting this slide then we tend to say okay renal artery doppler is normal so patient does not have a renal artery stenosis in the severe hypertensive patients how correct or how incorrect we may be you see the complete examination if you look at this are all recent uh, literature reviews if you look at the <clears throat> uh, all the patients that you survey you will be able to achieve 50 to 90% success rate on average renal artery doppler will pick up 60 to 65% of cases because it depends on the renal anatomy uh, the obesity the bowel gases of the patient the preparation of the patient there are a lot of things that come into play but still is it good yes it is good it has a class 1b recommendation from the european society and why is that it has high sensitivity if you pick it up it can occur in in 82% of the patients once you pick it up where you get a good window yes and it has a reasonably high specificity so it's a good test to do and then you have criteria right you look at the peak velocity in the renal artery and the classic criteria is the renal to aortic peak systolic velocity ratio if it's more than 3.5 you say oh the renal artery is showing higher velocity than the aorta therefore the renal arteries post stenosis have certainly is the cause of renovascular hypertension now 
uh, don't go too much by the percentile stenosis reporting by your radiologists on the renal Doppler because they will not be able to differentiate between 50 to 70 and above. The same is true for CT coronaries also, which we do. So the point is, all radiologists will report 50% and above as significant. But your interventional cardiology team from SIMS may not. So that's okay. That's perfectly okay. So don't sort of blame one or the other. Point is, 65% you are going to pick up, 30 to 35% you are not going to pick up. Second is pheochromocytoma, right? That was the second thing. Urinary VMA, yes or no? The basic test to do is this. So... I was discussing with Milan, unless you are a good clinician or an internal medicine guy, you cannot be a good specialist, bottom line. Three things that are the marker that takes you towards pheochromo. High sugar, high calcium, erythrocyte count going up, erythrocytosis. This is hallmark of the triad of pheochromo. Before you talk of the big things and then you talk of the big things. Now see, VMA has other issues. It comes from a hepatic uptake. The... the Hydroxy uh, molecules uh, have a different metabolism and therefore VMA may not necessarily be a great test. The problem is its sensitivity. You have to remove a lot of drugs for 24 hours, then you do it. So if for 24 hours, after you collect the urine and send it, you are again going to pick up only 60 to 65% cases. But the specificity is good, 95%. So you do the plasma metanephrine, which has high sensitivity, 96%. Low specificity, 85%. And why is that? Because pheochromo secretes the catecholamines intermittently. So you won't have those catecholamine levels going up. So you check the urine. You see what's happening in 24 hours. Look at the specificity, 99.7%. So what's the message? Urinary VMA negative, you are going to miss 35 to 40% cases. Do the urine and the plasma metanephrine together, then you are sure it's a pheochromocytoma. You always say potassium is normal, therefore it's not a primary aldosteronism. Almost 40% of the patients, as you know, the basic fundamentals of primary aldosteronism will be normokalemic when they come for the first time, 40% cases. And therefore, this is a difficult chart, but the middle one, right in the middle says that the aldosterone, plasma aldosterone to plasma renin activity ratio, if it's more than 20. Or simple, plasma aldosterone concentration, if it's more than 15, is your first marker of saying, this is patient has got primary aldosterone. So what was the message? If you do urinary VMA, a renal artery Doppler and a, a serum potassium, and you say they are normal, so patient does not have a secondary cause of hypertension, you are going to miss out 35% cases. That's the bottom line. Okay. What's happening in 2020? Few things. I always thought diabetes have a higher propensity towards hypertension. It's the other way around also true. Those who are hypertensives and have resistant hypertension are more likely to develop a hyperglycemia and type 2 diabetes. 48% increased relative risk incidence. A new study called SMART Study Group, which has got published this month. Resistant hypertension requires three drugs. The new definition has one important thing, unlike the previous definition. You have those three drugs at the maximum or maximum tolerated doses. So need not always be maximum. If a patient doesn't tolerate the dose also, that's fine. It should be included in the criteria of resistant hypertension Previously, it was 140 by 90. As soon as the new guideline steps in, I'm sure it will be 130 by 80. Now, let me show you a project which got published this month. It's the research to practice R2P project which got published in the American Journal of Cardiology. And what does it say? Forget about this country. 25% of all individuals only are on the currently recommended three class of drugs, ACCB diuretic at the maximum tolerated drug. So we are not treating patients properly, right? Only 7% were prescribed chlorothalidone abroad. We have moved up a little better. The second line uh, drug, which then has to be added, or even the first line drug is uh, spironolactone or, or eplerinone. It's hardly used in 21 in 4 patients. So there is a big scope there. 
what surprised me was amazing. I thought we are the only ones who propagate beta blockers. This is the American data. Beta blockers was prescribed in 90% of those truly resistant hypertension patients, including if you remove all the necessary compelling indication, 78% of the patients are still given beta blockers. So if you're using a beta blocker, that's what world over has been used despite whatever the guidelines they formulate, right? The commonest cause is patients don't taking proper treatment. I think that's important. Adherence level is so important that you have data ranging from 30 to 40 percent of the patient not taking drugs. Okay. Here is the guideline which is which I'm sure must be discussed over the last few days. After the three, add a MRA. After that, still not a target. Add a beta blocker or a moxinidine. I am fond of moxinidine. If it doesn't work, then you have hydralazine and then you have minoxidine. And then you have two new things in 2020. You have a non-invasive device-based therapy, right? So you are interested in that non-invasive device-based therapy versus invasive renal artery denervation therapy, right? Should you first go to non-invasive and then stop on, step on to the invasive if the blood pressure doesn't get elevated, like the techniques which are mentioned? Uh, here is how it goes. Which for which patient? If you have a young patient below the age of 45 years and a high sympathetic drive and severe hypertension, then renal denervation. If you can demonstrate that the carotid body is showing a hypersensitive signal, then that may be appropriate. If you are elderly patient or non-compliant circulation, mind you, those are the bulk of patients. They may not do very well always on renal denervation or carotid baroreceptor activation. Then you need to do AV fistula, exactly like you do in dialysis patient, connect the femoral artery and wave. That's rocks AV coplar. And lastly, if nothing works, then you have a very expensive therapy called the baroreflex activation therapy. This is what 2020 will have the future for. I have to speak on uh, LIPOA a case-based presentation. It's interesting. So. Maybe we can have a question. They told me we should have one buzzer question at the beginning. May I have that? All right. So uh, please instruct them to vote for the buzzer. Do you think it's an important contributor in India in CAD? Yes, no. In the premature coronary artery disease in the younger people? Or really, I don't care. If you want to answer one of them, please vote now. This is to get a gist of what do you think of LIPOA in, in today's day. And uh, there's a strong belief that it contributes to the coronary artery disease. So I let's have the second question now. And that will put the whole uh, case in presentation. So is there a meaningful treatment? If you say that this is a risk factor, then do you treat it with statins? Yes. With PCSK9 inhibitors? Yes you still fall short of achieving the target goals which you want for lipo a3 and uh, you don't care really sunday so can you please vote for it yes generally speaking you know the last 2.5 12.5% .5%, you know you should not care too many things in a meeting otherwise you lose focus on everything else in life however having said that let's get on show you a quick case so here is a 55 years old male perfectly okay this is a true case eh? he's a wedge and absolutely compliant with lifestyles there is no family history of premature cardiac acute inferior wall fair lv uneventful course in the CCU did very well. His LDL was 114 in the traditional lipid profile and we did nothing else because there is no recommendation that you start doing a liposmol A in each and every patient who walks in with a coronary artery disease. Let's make it simple. Beside the expenses, we don't have that evidence. So 114 LDL, right? You want to get it down and get it down to 50s, 55s or whatever. And Joe was done. Interestingly, it showed plaque in the LAD and a, uh, a circumflex at a 90% lesion. It, it was an inferior volume, by the way. And uh, the LAD just had a plaque. The circumflex had a tight lesion. LAD had just a little plaque. And we said, it's okay. I mean, we can leave it at that. He goes on the medical treatment. And this is in 2013. 2013. He comes back after five years with an absolutely 
proper lifestyles, LDL of 48.4. So it's all well achieved. HDL is 24, whatever importance you want to give it. He's on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin with a LDL of 48. The LA developed a 90% lesion. Now, what do you give an answer to this gentleman, right? You have achieved the best possible LDLC. Maybe you could have knocked it down a little further, but 48 is also not bad in my opinion. It's not that you may achieve everything great beyond that. So tight lesion in the LDL, uh, in the in the LAD, and the lipo turned out to be 110 milligram per deciliter. And we said, this is the culprit, possibly. Or the HDLC could be a culprit, possibly, we wouldn't know. So let me quickly go through some of the evidence. Some is theory, but it's important to understand. Why is lipo A important? Lipo A comes from the hepatocytes. It has the connection of a ApoA, the protective one, and the ApoB. Depending upon the number of cringels which are there, you decide how the genetic variant of a LipoA is and how toxic it will be to the heart and the cardiovascular system. So this has been the perpetual supporting actor in terms of what it can do with coronary artery disease. We would like to know what happens further. So I'm going to take you to a completely different area. This is this month's uh, obstetric and gynec journal and why should we review it? Uh, uh, something very different. Because I have to speak this weekend in Mumbai on this topic, I looked up how to decide the risk in preeclampsia in hypertensives and I came across a very novel article. It says preeclampsia, mind you, which has a large element of inflammation and thrombosis is characterized by a high LP of more than 40.5. In fact, if you have LP of more than 52.5, these patients do very severe and can turn from preeclampsia to eclampsia. This is a very novel thing. This is the first time I have read it. It tells you that inflammation and thrombosis is important. LipoA is a marker of inflammation and of thrombosis. So that's the relevant sort of, you can think as a paradigm. So, we have certain clinical trials which were talked about in the past and I'll show you at the end what is the evidence. Now, how do you put it in today's date? It looks like it is a, a, a risk factor in the general population. What is uncertain? What is uncertain? And this goes right up to this month. Uh, evidence is that we don't have a established proof that though it is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, it actually changes the mortality in the long term. Now, that's important. If you want to talk about the causal, a, a, a causal establishment of a risk factor causing a disease, you need to have a specificity. That's what it lacks. Now, how will it help you in, in the practice? It's not useful really once the patient has a coronary artery disease. It may not really change the outcome but it may have a role to play in the primary disease detection and prevention of coronary artery disease in patients who are at a high risk, right? So you have drugs which are available, which may, may not change the things. For example, PCSK9 in these days carry uh, importance in terms of lowering LPA. So in primary prevention, it may turn out to be useful. Uh, what is what has come up at the end of 2019 because you get updated in your meeting with your excellent cardiology team from SIMS as to what's happening every year. So let me tell you about it that uh, you see what will now become relevant is the amount of reduction of LP, absolute reduction which you will be able to achieve. If you can achieve that then you will be more certain that patients will be protected and that too on a population-based therapy. If you look at PCSK9, you will get about 30% reduction. Is it meaningful? Now we have a new drug called antisense oligonucleotide. And these drugs are going to change the way things are. Presently, statins do a little. Uh, PCSK9 does more. But what we need to understand is once you achieve the same LDLC reduction, either with statin or a PCSK9, 
add on 30% reduction of PCSK9, though I'm a fan of the drug, but it's not making an impact. It's not changing it. And that evidence is absolutely big and important. So what happened in, in these few months? PCSK9 was given to these patients and they underwent a PET MR to see what happens to the wall of the blood vessel. Does the inflammation go down? Does the thrombotic element go down? It was expected to go down. Unfortunately, it did not. So PCSK9 dropped the versus placebo a 14% drop. The mean LDLC went down by 61%. LDLC down by LPA down by 14%. But look below. Over a period of 12 weeks, there was absolutely no change in the arterial wall inflammation. So you may get a 30% reduction, but that's not meaningful. It's not changing anything, right? And that's the slide that the LDLC width becomes very wide, but the LPA doesn't change too much. It's a small change in the LPA, right? And this is, I think, a very crucial slide to understand. What we have in LPA is what we call as a, oh, sorry. Can you switch it on, please? Okay. What you have is a skew deviation. So, uh, is this the, no, okay. Let me use the mouse and explain you because this is the only slide that requires to be explained. Look here, the down thing here, not getting it. Population attributable risk. If the LPA is between 10 and 42 milligram per deciliter in a given patient, or the LPA is less than 93 milligram per deciliter, at that point of time, the population attributable risk does not change. So in a given individual, if LPA is, the risk is more, but on a population basis, if you start treating LPA, it's not going to make a difference unless it crosses 93 milligram per deciliter. At that point of time, you need an absolute reduction. This absolute reduction to make to make it meaningful should be 80 milligram, 80 percent. So I'm ending with this slide, and this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, Lancet paper which was published yesterday. It talks about the AKC APOA study. So now you have a drug called like the antisense oligonucleotide. What it does is, it's been given subcutaneous. It can be given once in a week or once in a month. When you give it once in a month, you can have a drop of about 70, uh, 72%. That's where the drug will have a further advantage. Whether it will reduce the arterial inflammation, we do not know. We'll come to know in a year or two years time. If it does, that's the answer forward. Till then, it's a risk marker but you don't have to necessarily target it aggressively. And that's not the indication to give PCSK9. PCSK9 is still to reduce the LDLC in indicated patient to very low levels. Thank you very much. All right. So we have the hosts on the show. Is there someone who is going to comment or should I go ahead and answer the questions? All right. So thank you. Thank you. And let me see the questions. OK. There are a couple of uh, important things that, uh, that are relevant. So let me go to the first part of the questions on hypertension. And there is an important question here that came up that is there a difference between the resistant hypertension and malignant hypertension? So let's understand is what is what is malignant hypertension? You see, uh, so there is a beautiful article, by the way, uh, uh, Dr. Kritika Dingra, who has asked these questions. It's published in the Journal of Human Hypertension beginning of the year, Jan 2020. All right. So malignant hypertension has undergone a definition change. In the previous days, malignant hypertension was defined as a diastolic blood pressure more than 130 millimeters of mercury and a Keith Wagner hypertensive retinopathy class 3 to 4. Right? Those were the two aspects. This 
year or probably in 2019 it has undergone a definition change where we are saying it is now defined as a blood pressure completely uncontrolled out of order plus three end organ damages the heart the kidneys and the brain so when you have a element of involvement of these organs and a very high blood pressure then you are sure that this is a malignant hypertension now resistant hypertension does not necessarily fit into this resistant hypertension behaves much better than a malignant hypertension malignant hypertension if it acutely comes falls in your categories of hypertension urgencies and emergencies treatable in our country with intravenous labetalol all over the world with intravenous labetalol and nicardipine resistant hypertension is different you are on optimized therapy and yet the 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 blood pressure doesn't get controlled so i hope that settles that question what are the potential causes of resistant hypertension two very important things non compliance this is the commonest cause of blood pressure not settling down and second is a excess intake of salt in diet because salt sensitivity is a vital fundamental of high hypertension which is difficult to control non pharmacological approach well it goes the same as in any hypertension restrict the salt to a significant extension one second um, have a good lifestyle modification and exercise and extremely important of course we know these days when ambulatory blood pressure studies have been done in resistant hypertension sleep duration and quality of sleep if the sleep is ensured for 7 hours and the quality of sleep is very good and there is no element of obstructive sleep apnea that's the way forward in terms of lifestyle modification uh, you have presented a case where a patient is uh, dr kritik on five drugs azelsart and metoprolol arkam in benedipin and ctd at the highest doses she has mentioned started with bp of 200 by 120 and now with five drugs it's 140 by 90 what do you do how long will you continue with five drugs as long as you need to keep the blood pressure down but the question is if you need to settle out and see what drugs you can start going off the shelf a little early in my opinion reduce or come in a little and probably in order to avoid a rebound hypertension i would change it to moxinidine instead of arcamin that's step 1 step 2 i would reduce metoprolol to a little lesser dose come down to 50 micrograms 50 mg rather benedipine is fine and cloth clorthalidone is fine and azelsartan is fine if there is a necessity to switch from benedipine you can go back to amlodipine or maybe that may not necessarily be a proof of the uh, you know sort of evidence available as on date but azelnadipine is another molecule at 16 mg which you can try so that's my answer to those hypertension related questions and uh, uh, dr kritika has three questions about lipoe what is the incidence of cardiac problems in our country with high lipoe the indian heart journal reports everything between 8% to 30% so differs but none of the studies have been greatly authentic we haven't been been able to establish a causality factor therefore how do you manage uh, patients of hypertension with high lp and normal lp no differently hypertensives if they have associated high ldl should merit a statin if they have a high ldn and a high lp maybe here is a, a a time frame when you can get the ldlc a little more aggressively down to maybe less than 50 and you could be okay however this is a clinical suggestion not that there is a great trial lastly uh as she has asked as high lpa levels are genetically determined and uh, what does that say there is no drug to lower high levels uh, can you try lpa afrss so well this is a interesting really interesting question so there has been a journal it's called the journal of clinical afrss so that reported one fundamental study as you saw my slides it looks like lipoe as on now the best drug to lower it at present are the pcsk9 inhibitors and evolucumab so evolofer is the study it's done in only 10 patients these patients were they had uh, familial hypercholesteremia characterized with a very high ldl and these patients also had high lp 
Now, there's nothing like a LPA FRS, it's a LDL FRSS, but the LDL FRSS also works to some extent in getting down the LPA molecule down. Now, these patients were uh, looked at for uh, comparison of evolucumab versus a LDL FRSS. LDL FRSS brought it down by about 40 milligrams LDL reduction, 40% compared to close to 90% with the LDL FRSS. What was interesting is, the reduction of LPA with evolucumab was superior. It was about, if I correctly remember, it was 45 in the arm which was given uh, uh, evolucumab versus 25 to 35 of those who, are, who underwent the, uh, the FRS. So it seems that LPA, at the final solution, may not be really a FRS. I still feel you will have to wait for the oligonucleotide uh, antisense drug, which will come up at some point of time. If it's PCSK9, uh, when you when you get a reduction, not just 30%, but in my opinion, if it's more than 110, because that's where you start looking at a linear risk. If you get it down by about 100 milligrams per deciliter, then the reduction will be very effective. I think I've covered all the questions. Thank you very much. If there is anything further, I can certainly. Oh, there is one by Dr. Amit on azilsartan vis-a-vis other drugs, azilsartan. So I was the principal investigator for a national study that's called RAS, which we uh, presented at uh, AHA Chicago, September 2019. Azilsartan is a great sartan. It's one ARB which can be used at the maximum dose, 80 milligram per deciliter. What impressed me, when I tried to correlate it with the data from abroad. So Ronald Schneider looked at, is this drug, which is effective in blood pressure lowering in young and elder, is it more effective in elder or more effective in young? It turned out that it's more effective to some extent in younger than the elderly population. Our study reports from India in the RAS uh, also showed a very significant difference, a very good efficacy in young. So this, in fact, uh, uh, sort of encourages me and puts my enthusiasm more of using ARBs in young hypertensives compared to other class of drugs. And azilsartan is a superior drug. Thank you. So those are my answers.